Another audio check. Spike Lee, Do the Right Thing. Brian Linehan, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> Spike has been visiting us annually. Okay. He's going to keep doing it until he gets that hockey sweater. Okay? Yep. Spike Lee in Do the Right Thing is producer, director, writer, co-star. And it's been said, Spike, particularly since the sensational, and I use sensational advisedly, reception of Do the Right Thing in Cannes, that you've managed to combine humor and drama to expose the absurdity of racism, a technique you use with stunning effect in She's Gotta Have It in School Days. But the first thing I want to say to you, as one of the Canadians meeting mm -hmm. you again, mm -hmm. is welcome back to Canada, welcome back to Toronto, because it was the Toronto Festival of Festivals, it was the 86th season, mm -hmm. correct? Right. You showed up with She's Gotta Have It, and you've become a regular. Now, is there, is there a special bit of affection in you as a filmmaker for Canadians and Canadian audiences? You want me to lie or tell the truth? Well, <laughs> I, I, I prefer the truth. Uh, I think that uh, I look at my films on a, a global outlook. I mean, I'm, I just can't be American anymore. People go to films all across the world, and so that's the way I look at films. And if, if I could cultivate an audience here in, in Canada and Toronto, you know, I'm welcoming all the fans I can get. Sounds reasonable to me. But Very there's something, reasonable. There's something I want to point out, because mm -hmm. when I refer to 1986 and the Toronto Festival of Festivals, we go right up to the summer of 89, and there you are yet again, this time at the 42nd Annual Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. People now talk about the importance and the value of the film festival in the presentation of movies. Considering your history and your life, what now is your opinion of the film festival in the initial impact of the movie? Well, it's not, I mean, it really it's really great for, for new people because, I mean, Spielberg doesn't have to put Raiders <laughs> in The Last Crusade in a film festival because everybody knows about it. But nobody knew about Spike Lee and she's going to have it. And film festivals, especially the Cannes Film Festival, that's where the whole world gathers to look at films. There's journalists, people in the media, critics come from all over the world to this one place in the south of France. And if you do good work, hopefully they'll get recognized and they go back to their homes and everybody knows about it all over. Uh, this happened where she's going to have it. It happened again this pa a couple weeks ago with uh, Do the Right Thing Cannes Film Festival. Of course, we got robbed of any award. But, uh, you know, it can be a springboard, you know, to launch a film. And, and, and you know, for she's going to have it. We open in August, right after Cannes, and, and we're opening early this time, June 30th. Now, you have made the remark, we got robbed of a prize in Cannes. Right. Now, I have you here. Mm -hmm. I want to get away from the newspaper stories, the speculation, gossip, and rumors. Among the jury members at the recent Cannes Festival, it was reported that Sally Field... She was the only one that... What about Hector Babenko? I thought you he was think, enthusiastic. I know. You'd think Hector would be, you know, Mr. Third World, Mr. Brazil, and all that stuff, you know, Prashot. But he had... Uh, he was lukewarm. Sally Field w was strongly for the film. The other six judges hated the movie. And, you know... Now, how do you know that, Spike? How do you know they hated it? How do you know uh, Sally Field felt? Did, did they tell you? Sally Field told me so after the day after the festival ended. We flew from Nice to, to Paris where I had, made my, where I had to make my connection back to, to New York and Sally Field was on my plane and I didn't even see her. She was sitting right behind me as we were leaving. She said she, said, she hit, tapped me on the shoulder, introduced herself. Of course, on who she was. She told me, you know, what the deal was. And... Uh, we got robbed. It was Ben Benders, who was a jury, I mean, the president of the jury. He did not like the film at all. And he Do you know why? Well, he, I heard he said he wasn't heroic enough. And uh, the, the hero, if you want to call him that, in Sex, Lies, and Videotapes is a pervert <laughs> that, that videotapes. He asked women very, various women very personal questions about their their sexual uh, whatever, and he videotapes it. And, you know, he gets off on that. 
So I guess that's heroic. Now we have to point something out because you are in Canada. Right. There were people at the Con Festival mm -hmm. who thought that the main prize, the Palme d'Or, mm -hmm. might be divided between Denny Arcand, mm -hmm. Jesus of Montreal, Spike Lee, do the right thing. Well, there was a time when that yeah. was the feeling that, geez, yeah, is it going to be Spike Lee's movie or Denny Arcand's? But Denny got an award. He still got the, the jury prize. I mean, awards was given out the 10 films. We didn't get one. But that's, that's the next question, Spike. Why not one of the 10 prizes when the film did have I mean, as Vincent Canby said in the New York Times, thank God for Spike Lee. I mean, the festival's moving along, and suddenly there's a movie that is controversial, that is causing discussion, the way film festivals should. People get together and say, what did you think? This is what I felt. It, it was an issue at the festival. Well, the jury, the, the, the award's not decided by the critics or the public. It's decided by these eight people on this jury that is chosen by Gilles Jacob. And uh, Vin Vendors was very influential influential on the choices uh, that, that, that this committee was going to make. Uh, what I found surprising is that, you know, at the award, at the award dinner, after the, the ceremony, they were asked him, you know, what was about sex lives and videotapes he liked. He said, well, you know, this is the future of cinema. And I, I think the fact that we haven't, we didn't get any war, I guess we're not in his future. But it's over with. I think that Despite the fact that we didn't win anything, we still came out of the festival in great shape with a great, a great amount of publicity. And even more, seems that because we didn't win anything, and, and people know it's an obvious snub, and, and it's a good film, Sex, Lives, Videotape. I liked it a lot. But, you know, everybody thought he was going to get the Commodore, which, which is for the, the, best, the best first film, not the Palm Door. How about Denny Arcand's Jesus of Montreal? I didn't get a chance oh, to see, see that, that because uh, I was doing interviews left and right, but I, but I did get to see his other film the last time I was in Cannes, too. Uh, the Decline and Fall yes. of the American Empire, as seen through the eyes of a French Canadian <laughs> filmmaker. You like that one, don't you? Yeah, it was, it was a good film. There's something else that I have to point out because I think it, there's a real touch of irony. When you went to Cannes in 86, after, by the way, I must point out that it was your thesis that first started the attention, and I think it's admirable that I can sit in front of you and point out the Spike Lee Fellowship Award for minority mm -hmm. students in filmmaking. Is it the Tisch? Yeah, College NYU Film NYU. School. Yeah, we just started that this year. Well, it's an admirable thing that you've done. Thank you. Not at all. When I think of what your thesis <laughs> did for your life and your career, and the name of your thesis again was? Joe's Best Eye Barbershop, We Cut Heads. It won the, <coughs> excuse me, won the Student Academy Award. We did that in eight. <coughs> we did that in 82, and She's Gotta Have It, we did three years later. Isn't it amazing, Spike, that She's Gotta Have It went to Cannes, and it was put in, was it the Director's Fortnight? Yeah, Director's Fortnight. Director's and, Fortnight. And people screened it and said, geez, Spike Lee, She's Gotta Have It. What a wonderful piece of movie making. But it was out of competition. And the stories out of this year's Con Festival include the one that Sex, Lies, and Videotape was supposed to be in that very category. And somebody made a last minute decision to switch it mm -hmm. and put it in competition. Now I know, I know, <laughs> you're laughing already. I know that I'm projecting and jumping ahead a few years. Mm -hmm. But how come that kind of a decision wasn't made in 1986 where she's got to have it? Why, why make the change in 89, well, in your opinion? I think I think his film should have been. I think that film was good enough to be in competition. I saw a lot of the other films too. It's a very good film. You know, I would have liked to win the the Palm Door. We did, it. and if he won it, that's fine. But the fact that we didn't get anything that's that's what I'm. A, that's what I was upset about. You know, it's over with. But we were kicking and screaming that night, though. We we the award ceremony was at seven thirty. At five o'clock, they told us and told. Five o'clock, they called and said we didn't win anything. So then there was a big decision about what we should do. Should we go to the awards ceremony? Should we not go? Should we have some kind of demonstration or protest in the middle of the awards ceremony? We just get up and leave as a group. But at the end, the cooler heads prevailed, and they said, Spike, don't do anything stupid. Just go and sh be a good sport. I hate to lose as it is. And we just sat there and 
with their hands in their mouths and grumbling. And we just went back to their hotel room and had some champagne and packed. And the next morning we were out of there. Something else we had to deal with because when Do the Right Thing was seen in Cannes, mm -hmm. the report from the European press was that the European critics really embraced the film. Mm -hmm. The North American, and I include Canadian, North American press raised questions about racism, mm -hmm. about violence. Well, I, don't, I don't think they, they, didn't, they didn't raise any questions about racism. I think that that's... Violence. That, what they harped on was the violence. They, you know, they were, their mode of thinking that this film is dangerous, that this film should not come out in the summertime, that this film was made, that I made this film with the intent purpose of inciting riots, which is all false. And uh, so that's something I'm going to have to continue to address now, the whole next month, and even after the film is open, because people will, will still be convinced, no matter what I say, that I made this film to start an uprising, which is not the truth at all. This film was made to, to, to start some discussion, some provoke some thought about racism, which I feel is not just an American problem, I think it's a world problem. That's something I had to reprimand the, the European critics to, you know, to in Canada at the, at the press conference, because they, you know, they could sit here smug in Europe and say that racism is an American problem, and I pointed out to the French critics, you know, like, you know, that's not true because I know a whole lot of Algerians, Africans, and people from, you know, Senegalese that are catching hell in France. So it's not just America, you know, this, this is a problem that, that affects the world. The other question you had to address in Cannes, which was directed at you, and I, mm -hmm. I'll let you quote yourself on mm -hmm. this. People wanted to know where the drugs were. Right. And you came out with a very succinct answer. Well. I think that that's a very good question, where are the drugs, but I also had to turn that question back around on them. Because at this point in time, 20 years ago, you could say the drugs was contained within the ghettos across the country. But that is not the case. The reason why, you, why, why drugs is on the cover of Time and Newsweek is because white, middle class, and upper class America, their kids are on crack too. And so drugs is not something that just contains them black people. So if that is the case, why is it, why is it when there's a film about black people, will you come to this film expecting the film to see drugs in the movie? Whereas if you see Wall Street or Working Girls or any other film, they, that, that, that thought would not come into their mind. And that is because <clears throat> people are conditioned. I mean, I think, I think another thing that's make this film, what makes this film uncomfortable is that this film actually confronts people's own racism that they don't think that that was in them. Because when you, when you come to a movie theater, when you come to a, a movie and it's about black people, and your preconceived notions are, well, if this film is about black people, well, that means that there should be drugs in it. I should see some rapes in it. I see some murders in it. I should see some 13-year-old mother throwing their baby out of a window. To me, that, that's showing you know, what your preconceived notions are about us as a people. And, that, and I think that's, that's racist. So that's why we're having, that's why people, that's why a lot of ways, it's, you know, it makes people squirm. I, but this is something that's not an easy, it's not, a, it's not an easy subject matter. But nonetheless, you still have to deal with it. One of, one of several extraordinary performances and do the right thing comes from Danny Aiello. Great, Sal. he's great in the Sal's film. Sal's famous pizzeria. Now, we are told that it was Robert De Niro who led you to his buddy, Danny Aiello. Yes, I wrote the role originally for De Niro, but he couldn't do it, and he suggested that Danny uh, would be a good choice. And, and then Danny said, I have some members of my family I like working with. And you <laughs> said, sorry, Danny, I got all my relatives on this movie. No, Danny, uh, his son, Danny Jr., Danny the third is his, is his stunt double. And his other son, Rick, plays the cop that murders uh, Ray Raheem. And may we point out how many members of your family are involved in Do the Right Things, Mike? Well, my father, Bill Lee, did the score. My sister, Joie, plays my sister in the movie. Uh, my brother, David Lee, he was a still photographer on the film. And my other brother, Sankey, he was in Jim Jarmusch's film that was in Cannes, Mystery Train. So we have a somewhat artistic family. You certainly do. There's something else I'd like to know. Mm -hmm. 
When people talk about what you accomplished with She's Gotta Have It and less than $200,000 was spent, then school days came along. You had oh, Columbia six, Pictures. Oh, six and a half That million. was six, six and a half. Right. Do the right thing is six, six and a half. Six and a half. Right. The irony is that nowadays, in the summer of 89, six and a half is referred to as a shoestring budget. It is. Well, the average Hollywood film is $18 million now. 18 is now the average? Yes. So we're, we're at Universal got a bargain. <laughs> This is a and third. I'm sure you've told them, Spike, this is a bargain. <laughs> this could have been Dick Tracy, and I'm not Warren Beatty, you've got a bargain. <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting a better film, too. <laughs> hey, let them finish it, Spike. <laughs> no, that's... Don't. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Anyway, uh, it, it is a bargain, but the way... When you do a film like She's Gonna Have, you can only do a film like that one time in your life. The favors you have to ask. People are only going to work free one time, and then everybody wants to get paid. And they should be. So that's why uh, the films will cost, to, you know, as much as they have. But that's not, in the real world, you know, that's not a lot of money for Hollywood films. Are you, because you pointed out the volume of publicity, the press you did get in Cannes, it was still important and worthwhile for you to travel all the way to the south of France and have that movie in that film festival forum, wasn't it? It was very even important. Even without the prize. Even without the prize, because... We received, we, we got the, the push that we needed to launch the film for the June 30th release in the United States and, and here in Toronto. And the film's going to open in two weeks in Europe. I mean, the prize is nice, but really, what you really want is a great critical response, a great response from the movie-going audience. And that's what we got, so we're very happy with the outcome of uh, Cannes. The award would have put icing on the cake, but in the long run, you know, it's the other stuff outweighs of the award. And in the middle of all of this, Spike, did Sally Field on that flight say to you, Spike, anytime you've got a script for me, I'd like to read it? No, she didn't say that. She was really more apologetic. She really felt bad that, uh, that we didn't win anything. She, she really felt for the film. And, you know, I want to thank her because she didn't have to say anything to me. I didn't, she didn't have to even let me know that she was sitting behind me because I didn't see her. But she went on her way and she wanted to try to explain just what happened and uh, it didn't make it any easier, but I appreciate you know, what she did. And uh, the next time I see her, I'm going to thank her again. Do the Right Thing is available to moviegoers. What's the fourth feature film from Spike Lee? You got a script in your bag in there? Uh, it's a film called Love Supreme. It'll be a, about jazz, contemporary jazz. It won't be you know, anything like in the 40s or 50s. Lots of Miles Davis? Well, <laughs> I see what you're traveling with, Spike. I know the family's musical, but you have to include <laughs> others. Uh, Miles is a very good friend of mine, but uh, it'll be a, it's about a fictional character. It's not based on anybody living or dead. Now, will you perform in this? No, I'm going to be a manager of a, of a musical group. Uh, I won't be playing any instruments in this film. All right. I wish you great success right, with your new venture. All right, thank you very much. Welcome back to the city of Toronto, and it's good to see you. We've got a new stadium here now, right? Yes, we have. You're going to stay long enough to see a baseball game? Uh, Are you kidding? You got to do a, you're going to do a city a day, aren't you? It's going to be like that. Well, there'll be another book. I've got my copy of School Days. <laughs> there'll be a book, My Life on the Road by Spike Lee. Why not? All right. It's good to see you again. All right. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.